you were in the heart of the Belgian Congo and a group of warriors charged like this, you too would be glad to find out that it was all in fun. Not so long ago they killed strangers for food, for this is the cannibal tribe supreme. The Mangbetu are only one of innumerable tribes, for Africa is a vast land of many different peoples, speaking over 800 languages and dialects. Surrounded by his bodyguard and by some of his 37 wives, Chief Tungalo welcomes his visitors. He is the supreme ruler of the Mangbetu and Myogo tribe, once the fiercest cannibals in all Africa. The silver medals are his badge of authority, given him with due ceremonies by the Belgian government. The sad-faced crown prince already feels the weight of future problems of state, and the drums give the signal to begin the famous vulture dance. As the drums beat, the women keep time with seed-filled gourds. The warriors dance and jump in imitation of the vulture, the most important and useful bird in tropical Africa. He is a scavenger, eating the flesh of dead animals and thus preventing the spread of pestilence. With wild shouts, the dancers imitate the vultures in flight. The young chief tries his talents at dancing, as the women encourage their warriors by be beating time and chanting. At one time, this tribe numbered over a million people. It has since been cut up into several smaller tribal units in order to prevent too much power coming into the hands of any one chief. Mangbetu women are especially proud of their long, narrow heads, for in this tribe the long, tapered skull is the highest mark of beauty. This tiny infant has already been started on the road to beauty. Its head is bound tightly with fibers from the palm leaves. This little girl has a typical long head and eventually will bring a large price in marriage, for according to Mangbetu's standards, she is a great beauty. This older girl reveals the egg-shaped head of the Miogo women. The monkey bones in her hair indicate that she is still unmarried. This custom of binding the head is very much akin to the old Chinese practice of binding the feet of little girls, all in the name of beauty. Here is the headdress of the married woman of the Mangbetu. Her own hair is worked with great skill into the shape of a flat-topped hat. She is the wife of the chief, Tungalo, the queen of all the Mangbetus, and she really is every inch a queen. Her long head with its fine hairdress, distinguishes this dusky matron as a glamorous Congo beauty. Here is another bevy of Congo beauties, but what a difference from the long-headed Mangbetu to the duck-billed women of the Bamburi tribe is only a matter of about 300 miles, but the standards of beauty are very different. This strange practice started as a protection against raiding slave traders. By making themselves hideous in this way, the Bamburi women sought to destroy their value as slaves. The dread raiders have long disappeared, but the custom of enlarging the upper lip still survives as a beauty cult. The Bamburi are a sociable people. These women readily leave the community house to have their pictures taken. Women do most of the work, and the Bamburi women are noted farmers. One of their principal crops is tobacco, of which they are very fond, for smoking is one of their very few diversions. Other crops include yams, corn, melons, bananas, pineapples, cauliflower, onions, and papaya. One of the most ancient of the Nile peoples, the Bamburi cling to their old established customs so closely that it is hard to foresee any likely change in this strange beauty cult. The lip stretching has started when they were babies, and by adding larger discs from time to time, the skin of the upper lip is distended until it stretches around a wooden platter five to six inches in diameter. Deep scars created by cutting the skin, plugging the wounds with clay and fiber so as to raise these ugly welts, are marks of beauty to the Mahdi. The women wear only a girdle of leaves, for the country in which they live, almost on the equator near the River Nile, is so hot that clothing would be unhealthful. They are a very cleanly people, bathing frequently, changing their entire costume at least twice a day, and never wearing a dress more than once. Of course, this is not so hard in a country where the dresses literally grow on trees. By carrying heavy burdens on their heads, the young Mahdi women develop excellent postures. Two Mahdi mothers meet and talk about their babies, as mothers will, all over the world. 
Where are the babies? Very much as an American Indian carries her papoose on her back, these African mothers have their young ones always with them. When the child grows fretful, the mother seeks to amuse it by scratching the side of its baby basket with the knife that is her sole tool and weapon in the jungle. If this does not quiet the little one, the basket is removed and his wants are attended to. Here are two mothers of still another African tribe, the pygmies. They are really very shy and depend for their safety upon the uncanny ability to keep out of sight. Word had been sent into the forest that a white visitor had arrived with gifts for the pygmy chief. After a day or two, the first pygmies arrived at our clearing, a man and his wife. They took up their abode in a banana leaf hut to await the arrival of their chief. The following day, a large party of pygmies came cautiously out of the deep forest, armed men in the lead, followed by their women and children. They have walked many miles, but to them this is no hardship. Their chief proved to be a Sangha, an old friend whom I had met nine years before on an earlier exploration. Other white men had visited him since that time, but he remembered me as the first member of my race that he had seen. The first arrivals became quite friendly. These pygmies are full-grown, mature men and women. As I am only five feet eight, you can get a good idea of the smallness of these Ifi pygmies. They are just the little people of the great Congo forest, which furnishes their every need. Their clothing is made from the bark of trees. Bananas and other fruits are abundant the whole year around, and their huts are quickly made from banana and palm leaves. Their hunters furnish all the meat they desire, for these little men are expert marksmen with a bow and arrow. Surprising as it may seem, these tiny weapons with poisoned arrows are enough to bring down an elephant. Here they use the banana stalk as a target. Every good shot is applauded by patting themselves in the upper arm, and there are many good shots. Throughout Africa, it is excellent policy to keep natives friendly by giving presents, and the pygmies are certainly no exception. Chief Asanga is particularly fond of tobacco, and an oversized cigar proved the most welcome gift we could possibly have offered. He smokes in solitaire splendor. His followers sit at a respectful distance, for the pygmy chief rules in his own right. The chief gives a signal to start the dance. Two distinctive types of drums are used in the dance. One is cut from a single piece of wood, hollowed out in a long slot. This is the famous jungle telegraph, whose booming notes carry for miles through the jungle to tell distant tribesmen the latest news. The other is made from bark and skin. Dancing is as necessary to the pygmies as food and drink. Everyone joins in, men, women, and children. Life is very simple. They hunt, eat, sleep, and for pleasure, they dance. It is to be expected that these dances are very similar to those of the Kalahari Bushmen, for the pygmies are but another branch of the African Aborigines. When the Bantu races swept over Africa, followed in turn by the white invaders, one branch of the Aborigines sought refuge in the barren deserts of the south, while the other, these pygmies, found new homes in the dense Congo forests. Here they dance with light hearts, for they live in abundance and security. After several days of visiting with us, Chief Asanga and his pretty wife get ready to take their people back into the deep forest. They tell us in Tiki Tiki, their own language, that they hope we are all well and that hunting is good in our country. Regretfully indeed, we take leave of this lovable little people and of our other Congo curiosity.